Okay, great. So I think we're we're ready to uh, to start for the day on time. On time this time, we'll we'll do it. And uh, so our first big session this morning is this econometric panel, uh, this panel about the econometrics of polygenic prediction. And there's really two parts to this. So we're going to have talks to, uh, first from uh, James and, and from Q uh, talking about uh, about what what they see as the experts you know, in the room here on uh, on on the on uh, on polygenic prediction, what they see as the sort of frontier questions and methods uh, that that this audience should be aware of. Uh, and so we're first a point one. We're tremendously grateful. Um, for that service of you know coming in here and really educating the the, the economists uh, 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 on on what what we think is 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 at the frontier here, and then secondly we move into the experimental phase of uh, of, of this panel, which is um, you know we've asked some distinguished econometricians to provide their reaction to this enterprise, right? So this is a very open-ended uh, kind of invitation and it's asking a tremendous amount of, uh, of, uh, of uh, John and Ben to sort of say, you know, you don't do this work, but we really want some outside, you know, uh, you know perspectives from econometricians about, about, you know, how do you react to this, this, the general enterprise, the specific methods that are at play, you know, what are your, what are your kind of ideas here? And so, you know, a you know the second point then is that that's a big ask and uh and um uh you know we're really really grateful that they agreed and took that on and we really want to view these talks as starting a conversation right that they, these are not they're not presenting papers they're not uh even discussing individual papers they're kind of uh responding to an entire chunk of uh of, of this field of social science genomics and we really we've built in a lot of discussion time then after which only got bigger because of uh, Matt's, uh, you know, uh, illness and his inability to be here. Um, we have we'll have a lot of time for discussion after that, and I, so I really hope we we treat this as just starting a conversation about what 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 could be the fruitful ground for econometrics and econometricians to be working in this space, and and uh, and vice versa. What 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 we can take away as econometricians and applied researchers from the the frontiers and in, in social science genetics. So with that. Turn again uh, to to James, and he'll he'll start off the the morning. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so I'll be talking uh, about methods that we use in genome wide association studies, most of which actually precede the step of constructing polygenic scores. Um, so I'll start with uh, LD score regression, which turns out to be uh, something foundational to a lot of the things I'll be talking about. So LD score regression is foundational because it turns out that you can use it to help with uh, what seem to be almost totally unrelated goals, uh, rather remarkably. Uh, so these are uh, correcting, detecting, at least somewhat uh, confounding in genome-wide association studies, uh, estimating a quantity that we call the genetic correlation, and uh, what, we, uh, what you might think of as partitioning heritability, that is decomposing it into um, parts attributable to different parts of the genome. So I was talking yesterday about how Mendel's second law doesn't hold over SNPs that are close together, and that's why correlations between SNPs that are close together often persist. Uh, so you can see this in this color-coded correlation matrix of chromosome 22, common SNPs on chromosome 22. Uh, redder means uh, more correlated. You can see that it's mostly a vast sea of blue, which means that SNPs that are far apart are almost always uh, show close to a zero correlation. However, if we blow up the diagonal, uh, you can see that's that's not true for SNPs that are close together. Um, often, the SNPs that are close together are highly correlated. Now, the the fact that drives LD score regression is that the extent to which a SNP is correlated with its neighbors varies from SNP to SNP. So you can see that there are some SNPs where the row, the column is all blue. So even its close neighbors, that SNP is not correlated with any of them. Uh, whereas you, you see other SNPs where its row, its column, same thing, um, uh, have a lot of red in it, so that it is highly correlated with many of its neighbors, okay? So a quantity that we calculate to uh, capture this variation is called the SNPs LD score, which is basically the sum of its squared correlation with all SNPs uh, in the genome, essentially, although in practice, the SNPs far away are almost always uncorrelated, we usually just cut it off in a window. So the SNPs LD score, the sum of its squared correlations with all of its neighbors, including itself. So LD score cannot be smaller than one. Uh, this quantifies uh, what I've been talking about. 
Now, LD score regression. Um, so in this regression, the independent variable um, uh, is the LD score. Uh, the dependent variable, what uh, the variable regressing on the LD scores is the chi-square statistic from the GWAS, uh, the chi-square statistic summarizing the SNPs deviation from the null hypothesis of no association with the phenotype that you're studying, okay? So if you remember the GWAS summary statistics from yesterday, uh, we had the column with the Z statistics. Uh, we just square those, and then those are the chi-squares, okay? Now, a SNP with a higher LD score, that is, it's correlated with more of its neighbors, should tend to show a larger chi-square statistic because inherently it's going to be more likely to be correlated with one or more causal sites affecting the phenotype. In fact, that's what we observe. Uh, in fact, uh, this is a plot that's uh, in my pointer, but it's for schizophrenia, and you can see the remarkable linearity of the chi-square, um, the like LD-square regression. And this is something we observe for just about every phenotype. Um, um, uh, and so that expectation is borne out. In fact, one might naively try to use the slope of LD score regression to estimate the heritability of the trait. The idea being that the higher the slope, that means that um, as you're tagging more and more SNPs, uh, the more heritable the trait must be relative to some other trait with a lower slope. Um, now, I, was, I would say most people would say that would recommend not using LD score regression for this purpose. Um, uh, it's somewhat delicate for reasons that I won't really get into too much. However, here's a quantity that um, uh, is of greater interest. Um, this is the intercept of LD-score regression. So not the slope, but the intercept, where it hits the y-axis. Okay. So what does the intercept mean? Um, so you could think about it as the expected chi-square statistic of a hypothetical step with an LD-score of zero, which is actually impossible. But if you think about it conceptually, it's sort of an imaginary SNP that cannot tag its own causal effect, okay? So therefore, if the average chi-square statistics of these SNPs depart upward from the null value of one, so remember the expectation of a chi-square random variable with one degree of freedom is one, that departure must be due to confounding or other artifacts in your GWAS, such as uh, you've wrongly entered your sample size or whatever. Another way to think of it is that if the LD scores of the SNPs are uncorrelated with how confounded these SNPs are with uh, any environmental factors that might be affecting the phenotype that you're studying, then the effect of confounding in your GWAS will be just simply to lift the whole uh, slope of uh, the whole regression line, leaving its slope unaltered. And then where the line hits the y-axis must be the average extent to which confounding is contaminating your GWAS results. Um, so this is uh, a way of laying it out conceptually. Um, so uh, the chi-square statistic of a SNP, given its LD score, is equal to the null value of one plus whatever confounding bias may on average be present in the GWAS uh, plus a factor times the LD score. And that factor uh, can roughly be thought of as the heritability. Now, in LD-score regression, the dependent variable is not necessarily the chi-square statistic. We can also enter the products of the Z statistics from two different GWASs, or GWASs of the same trait, but in different individuals, say, in different sexes or in different countries. Um, here, this has a similar interpretation. Uh, we have no longer an intercept of one, but uh, we do have a possible um, inflation due to sample overlap between the two GWASs or things like that. And then plus a factor that's kind of like the genetic covariance, okay? Kind of like the genetic covariance, um, which I'll explain what that is shortly. Okay, uh, so here are some actual empirical applications of LD score regression. Uh, the first three, the sample size of the GWAS is a relatively small, so perhaps not too meaningful. Uh, subjective well being has a sample size of more than 300,000 people. Uh, so it's pretty remarkable, um, well, with both the smallness of the chi-square statistic and uh, the fact that, yes, theoretically, the intercept should be close to one in the absence of any confounding, and that's, that's what we get. Now, I told you that LD-square regression is not a good way to estimate heritability. When it's biased, its bias is almost always downward. That is, it tends to underestimate the heritability. 
Now, because the slope and the intercept um, are coupled in linear regression, it's like a seesaw. If one thing goes up, the other thing has to go down. Uh, the bias in the slope as an estimator of heritability means that the intercept will tend to creep up as the GWAS sample size increases, even if there is no uh, confounding in the GWAS. Uh, so what's been recommended by the developers is to um, uh, to sort of deal with that is to normalize by the average chi-square statistic in the GWAS. Uh, that sort of just normalizes it by the sample size. And once we do this, we can see that uh, um, uh, the inflation percentage is zero is the best number. Uh, we see that uh, they don't depart too much from that. Now, the case of height is interesting. Um, so LD score regression is going to work perfectly as an estimator and corrector of confounding if the LD scores are not correlated with environmental factors that affect the phenotype. It turns out, though, that we've learned that that sometimes happens. Um, for example, um, LD scores do follow a geographical gradient from south to north across Europe. Um, so SNPs that show a relatively large differentiation between, say, Italy and Sweden will tend to show larger LD scores. And so there, for any environmental factor, or it could also be genetic factors actually, but any factor that say affects height more on one, uh, one pole of Europe than the other, uh, and if that affects the phenotype that you're studying, uh, this is not gonna be fully detected by LD score regression. However, I find it interesting that of all the GWAS that have a really large sample size, um, that I believe that this, GWAS of height for 2014, where we know for other reasons uh, there are substantial problems with confounding and so on, does show the largest uh, inflation proportion. Okay, so even if um, it's not perfect, it does show you where the problems are, relatively speaking. Okay, uh, next topic: biological annotation of GWAS results. So I think yesterday we talked a little bit about wanting to know what are the intermediate mechanisms through which SNPs exert their effects. Uh, sometimes we try to do this with candidates for mediation that we've actually measured, such as uh, gene expression or um, maybe even behavioral variables that we think might be mediators. Uh, however, we can also apply a family of techniques that we call biological annotation immediately to the GWAS uh, summary statistics. Uh, often in this endeavor, we're, uh, we use these uh, databases that contain these classifications that we call gene sets. I called the gene a cistron yesterday, but since there's no risk of confusion today, I'll just use the word we all use, gene. So a gene is just a, a gene set is just a group of genes that these database curators um, believe share some property, such as um, their encoded proteins participate in the same pathway or they're expressed in the same tissue or cell type. Uh, so an example of a gene set would be the mouse phenome category, decreased brain size, uh, which temporarily was our number one hit for EA2. Um, then some cohort withdrew and then the, the results got rearranged. But anyway, um, which our def its definition is that these genes, when, they're, um, when their function is interfered with in mice, one of the resulting phenotypes in the mice is a reduction in brain size. Okay, so LD score regression uh, actually surprisingly can help us with this. Um, the approach of, we call it stratified LD score regression is to decompose heritability into contributions from different gene sets. This is possible because the SNPs total LD score can be stratified into components, each component reflecting that SNPs correlation with just SNPs that are mapped to a particular gene set, okay? So you can calculate uh, multiple LD scores for each SNP. One of those LD scores might be just that SNPs correlations with uh, genes that are in or near members of the gene set decreased brain size, for example, okay? So this way, uh, we can go beyond what we can do in twin and family studies, say, which just outputs one number, the heritability. Uh, we can now start to divvy up the heritability to different parts of the genome. Now, when we, a gene set accounts for a disproportionate share of the heritability, uh, we say that it is enriched. Um, so uh, here's um, uh, another way to see that. So if in the denominator, we have the fraction of all common SNPs that are in or near genes that are members of that particular gene set. The numerator, we have the fraction of the heritability that's attributable to SNPs in that gene set. Uh, 
Usually if this ratio is significantly greater than one, we say that the uh, gene set is enriched. It's also of interest to look at things that are significantly smaller than one, in which we, case we say the gene set is negatively enriched or impoverished. Okay, so here are the results from uh, EA3, GWAS of Years of Education um, from 2018. Um, uh, positive enrichments are on the top, negative are on the bottom. The meanings of these gene sets can't really explain today, but some of them, uh, so regulation of neuron differentiation. Uh, this is the process by which neurons in development become specialized to uh, take on special roles in different layers of the cortex and so on. Uh, the synapse, the synapse is the point of communication between two neurons where they send signals to each other. Uh, exonogenesis is the process by which neurons uh, during development send out um, their output cables, so to speak, uh, their axons uh, to, to communicate with their targets. I also find it kind of interesting that among the negatively enriched gene sets, we find a, well, a lot of the immune system, uh, which is not what I would have guessed to be the least biologically relevant process for years of education, uh, but that, that, those are the results we have. Okay, now on to a topic that uh, my understanding is a lot of people will be interested in, genomic structural equation modeling. So this also starts with a concept that we need LD score regression for, uh, the genetic correlation. So suppose that each trait is the sum of a genetic part and an environmental part, and let us imagine if it were possible for us to just lop off the environmental parts and calculate the correlation between whatever remains, which is the genetic parts. And this is what in quantitative genetics we call the genetic correlation. Now, you can imagine this, but could we actually estimate this? Um, yes, it is possible, LD square regression. Remember that if we enter the products of the Z statistics, we end up with something like the genetic covariance. We can just divide that by the square roots of the two heritabilities and uh, we will have the genetic correlation. Although maybe a simpler way to think of it is just, we have the Z statistics from the two GWAS and we just look at those two columns and if there's a correlation between them, then we have a genetic correlation, all right? Although that's not in practice how we actually do it. Now I mentioned earlier that LD score regression will typically be a downwardly biased estimator of the heritability of a trait. Um, but remarkably, it turns out that, uh, you know, we've tested this in simulations and so on, and we've now proved this. It is a very good estimator, nevertheless, of the genetic correlation because the biases tend to cancel out from the numerator and the denominator, okay? So even if we never use LD score regression, to, well, almost never, to estimate the heritability, uh, we use it all the time to estimate the genetic correlation, and this is basically why. Okay, um, so now let's move on to structural equation modeling where we take correlations and use them to estimate these so-called path coefficients, okay? So Sewell Wright, uh, geneticist, uh, he was basically the inventor of structural equation modeling. He spent the majority of his career here actually at the University of Chicago. Then when he became 65, Chicago told him you have to retire, um, but he said, no, I don't wanna retire. So uh, he moved to Wisconsin, Madison, where he was pretty productive actually for another 30, 35 years. Um, so, um, although, you know, what's interesting is that um, Ronald Fisher's daughter uh, married George Box, who was a statistician in Madison. So he often visited her there and uh, Sewell Wright was his great rival. And um, so whenever Fisher came, James Crow and these people, they would arrange it so that the two men would never encounter each other. Um, well, anyway, path analysis is Sewell Wright's gem. I don't think anyone can say that Fisher outshone him here. Um, so basically, um, genomic SEM is not that different from vanilla SEM with phenotypic correlations. We All we're doing is instead of the phenotypic covariance matrix, we're using the genetic covariance matrix. Uh, so let me explain how this works. Um, so Wright formulated these so-called path tracing rules. So basically, a path tracing rules concern these so-called paths that occur in a structure that uh, we, we sometimes call a path diagram, sometimes we call it a directed acyclic graph. So there's these three kinds of ways in which two variables in this structure can be connected to each other. 
Uh, the first we might call it directed path, which is just a sequence of arrows representing asymmetric causal effects all going in the same direction. Uh, then we have these so-called confounding paths, uh, which are kind of like the directing paths, except uh, you have two of them emanating in the opposite directions in a fork from a variable that we call a confounder. Uh, finally, we have these colliding paths, so-called because we have a sequence of directed paths converging on a variable, the collider, instead of emanating from it. Okay. So Wright said that uh, if you want to know what is the correlation between two variables, and we'll state the rules for correlations instead of covariances because it's simpler and the more complicated way doesn't really add much in understanding. So this is for standardized variables. So Wright stated that the correlation between two variables is given by the sum over all connecting paths of the products of coefficients along these paths. Uh, so what do I mean by a connecting paths? So these include the two paths at the top that I just showed you, causal paths and confounding paths, okay? So the coefficients are just the causal effects and then uh, you just uh, multiply them out. And so you have these um, products of coefficients and you just add them up path by path to get the total correlation between the two variables. Now, confounding paths, uh, you know, often you might say, well, I'm just going to posit that these two variables are confounded, but I don't know what the confounders are. Uh, that's not necessarily a problem. You can just um, uh, treat all the confounders, and even if you haven't measured them and so on, by the correlation they induce and just treat that effectively as a single coefficient. Now, here's something that Wright, during his lifetime, knew he did not really understand and you know, he dealt with it in an ad hoc way. Um, but then later, um, various people, including uh, Judeo Pearl, came and clarified this. So normally, a colliding path is not a connecting path, okay? So the intuition is if two things directly affect something, those two things don't have to be correlated themselves. However, if there has been a conditioning on the collider, uh, then... Like for example, there's some kind of selection bias into your study, okay? And the selection occurs with respect to a colliding variable. Then what uh, Judea says is that the path is unblocked and becomes a connecting path, all right? Now, the tracing rule for an unblocked collider uh, is actually not well understood. And I believe my guess is that there is no general rule for these cases, but there is a particular case where we do know the rule. And that's in what we might call a complete matching between the colliding variables. So an example of a complete matching is non-selective assortative mating, where um, uh, you have people connecting to get married or something like that, and they're using some characteristic to sort themselves, and there is a complete sorting so that no one is left out, and it's one-to-one, it's -one, okay? In that case, the correlation between the colliding variables, whatever that is, is just another coefficient. Uh, to be multiplied in the trace of the path. And furthermore, um, if the paths that come into the endpoints of the collider are themselves valid paths, they are fully connected as well. Okay, so here's an example of how the path tracing rules work. Um, this example concerns the correlation between two siblings, or at least the genetic contribution to the correlation. There can be other contributions. Uh, so here we don't have any... Uh, uh, direct connect uh, causal paths between the sibling phenotypes in this example, uh, but uh, we do have a confounding path that goes like so, uh, and we trace all the coefficients, uh, so we have that red contribution to the correlation. Uh, this is also a valid path, so we have that contribution. Then we have this colliding path, which normally is not a connecting path, but uh, if we're looking at pedigrees where, of course, the siblings exists so the mating did happen so even though it doesn't seem like we've conditioned on something we have in fact have so this becomes a connecting path and let's just call the correlation between the spouses r um, and that's what you plug in if that's how the mating is actually happening and there's no correlated variable or latent variable that they're matching on um, so we have that contribution uh, then we have this path that's actually distinct uh, if you have a path that even though it overlaps with another path, if there's any distinct part, it's also, it's also a separate path. So again, you have these products of coefficients, you add them all up, and, this, and that becomes the total correlation between uh, the two variables. Uh, 
Okay, so to sum it all up, um, Wright's path tracing rules completed by his successors. Basically, they say you have a correlation between two variables. Uh, you find out all the valid paths that connect them, multiply out the coefficients. And so ba that's basically how estimation works. Um, so my example of the correlation between siblings is a little strange because there's all these symmetries and uh, it actually has some causal effects that can be derived a priori theoretically, which almost never occurs. Um, what usually occurs instead is that we have co coefficients that uh, are unknown. We're trying to estimate them. And basically the way you estimate them is you have, you know, how many variables you have in your system. You posit a causal system that relates them all. Uh, you have the correlations between all pairs. And so then you have the system equations given by the path tracing rules. And then you just do weighted least squares or something to estimate all the unknown coefficients. So one thing I'll say is that uh, I'm not actually a big fan of structural equation modeling. Uh, um, in order for the estimates to be correct, uh, usually it's critical that you your causal system is posited correctly. And it's very rare that you can actually test that in some system where you have like a dozen variables and 12 choose two or whatever. Um, also, this is critically important to remember. When you're using genomic SEM, you're basically taking the phenotypes, you're stripping them of their environmental terms. But then if you proceed to do genomic SEM and you're say, interpreting these things as causal effects or whatever, uh, measure, uh, measurements in the measurement part of the model, uh, can you legitimately do that with the genetic correlations as opposed to the phenotypic correlations? And I would suspect that there are cases where uh, no, you cannot. So I would say that genomic SCM is probably best limited to rather uh, modest applications with uh, not, not too many uh, variables. Um, so here's an example uh, from a paper that came out in 2021. Um, so here uh, we have a GWAS of cognitive performance, GWAS of educational attainment, um, and then we're testing SNPs. And so basically we have a a uh, three by three matrix where um, the correlations between the traits estimated by LD score regression, the diagonals, the heritabilities come from LD score regression as well. Then the covariances between the SNPs and the traits, we just pluck them the Z statistics out of the GWAS summary statistics. And then with some convenient assumptions like no residual variances and so on, we can do what they called a GWAS by subtraction where uh, 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 year, the years of education GWAS is decomposed into one component that overlaps with IQ, uh, and then an orthogonal component that is just, well, an orthogonal residual. I mean, we might loosely call that residual non-cognitive skills, but my understanding is non-cognitive skills is actually a defined concept in other fields. So really what this thing is, it's just a wastebasket that just contains everything else. Now, once you have a GWAS of cognitive component and a non-cognitive component, you can just do all kinds of things with them that we usually do with GWAS summary statistics. For example, we can do biological annotation. Uh, we can calculate polygenic scores. Uh, we can also calculate genetic correlations. And I think it's kind of interesting, the, the pattern of genetic correlations that emerges uh, when you apply uh, LD score regression with all these phenotypes and the summary statistics that emerge from this genomic SEM decomposition. For example, brain volume is, uh, all these differences are, are, are FDR05 significant. Brain volume is more correlated with the IQ component than the non-cognitive component. Schizophrenia shows opposite genetic correlations, uh, roughly equal magnitude with the two components. Um, uh, so schizophrenia um, goes negatively with IQ, positively with the non-IQ uh, component. And a similar pattern you see with all these other psychiatric disorders, uh, bipolar, obsessive compulsive, anorexia nervosa. Autism spectrum disorder is uh, one of those rare disorders that actually is correlated with IQ. Um, actually, I was just telling the story to Q. Um, Paul Dirac, he was, uh, he, his, he was set up with uh, Eugene Wigner's sister. Eugene Wigner was also a Nobel Prize winner in physics. Uh, so they were married. But even so, every time the couple was introduced to someone, Paul Dirac would point to his wife and say, this is Eugene Wigner's sister. Um, but anyway, 
That seems to go with the IQ component, not with the non-cognitive component. Um, and you can see that highest math class taken. Well, that pattern is comprehensible. You're not going to take, you know, algebraic geometry or whatever, unless probably you're in grad school. However, self-rated math ability, uh, you don't have to go to school to have a high regard for yourself in that. And there we see a correlation with only the cognitive component. And that's everything I prepared. Okay, I will, I will just say I noticed an inversion in this group of the word simultaneous equations models, <laughs> but the kind of model you were putting out and you had were basically called reduced forms from simultaneous equations. Mm -hmm. It traced through all the indirect effects with the huge literature in doing this. So I'm, what I'm wondering about from the point of view of the economists sitting in the room, mm -hmm. people trained in economics and those simultaneous equations. In what sense is this different from it? In what sense are you contributing to that literature above and beyond what's already in the standard simultaneous equations? If, if I, I understand what you mean by simultaneous equations, um, it's just the same old thing, except now we use a genetic covariance matrix rather than a phenotypic covariance matrix. I think that gives you a chance to actually answer a question that I should have answered. Why do you want to calculate a genetic correlation when you can calculate a phenotypic correlation? Uh, well, there's various reasons. Um, sometimes we could calculate the genetic correlation with far, far more precision that we could calculate a phenotypic correlation. So if you're in a small country like Sweden and you want to calculate correlation between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, you just don't have a lot of schizophrenics and bipolar disorders, um, uh, people with bipolar disorder. And also, um, uh, the techniques, tetrachoric correlations or whatever, um, uh, to do that uh, can not, not work so well when you have small numbers of cases. However, with GWASs of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder uh, in, in the hundreds of thousands of people, uh, we could calculate the genetic correlation between these two disorders with like virtually zero standard error. Um, there, 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 there are some there are some advantages to the to the genetic approach. I mean, how do you correct the system sort? It looks like you, you're estimating these LDS scores and stuff. They're primary input to this process. You yes. have already estimated objects, and then you're going to feed them into another system. So yeah. you have two rounds of estimation. I don't know what's the standard procedure then in correcting for this simultaneous this, this double estimation procedure. Yeah, there, there, there are, are some, some problems, problems in all these score regressions. So the LD scores are estimated in what we call a reference panel. Um, and um, besides the problem of the reference panel in the original version of LD score regression being fairly small, um, uh, uh, sometimes it, 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 it makes sense to use the actual data that you use in your study and calculate your LD scores there. I would say though that my overall impression is that this is not a huge problem. That uh, uh, that we use larger panels like the Haplotype Reference Consortium to estimate the LD scores, and uh, it's it's uh, the error introduced by that into like messing up your slope or whatever is is pretty minimal. Millions of observations. Standard errors are close to zero. In principle, yes. When you motivated uh, sort of the genetic correlation, you had a separate model of genes and environment, mm -hmm. but like I think that's what I'm saying, like, like, like interaction. Mm -hmm. What's the meaning of a genetic correlation in that world where there is all kinds of interactions between genes and environment? Um, I mean, you could just, I mean, at one level, you could just say, well, uh, caveat emptor, uh, we're just calculating correlations between Z statistics of two GWASs and uh, uh, be aware that um, uh, there could be some problems. Um, I don't know, though. Um, I mean, the dust will settle eventually, but uh, I, I just don't know of any powerful G by E interactions. Um, so it's it's. Um, 
So I don't know. I, I just, it just feels like we could just sort of imagine we're just averaging over these things. But there would be equation systems where you would have G, where the mm -hmm. genetic data picking the environment. You could model that in this kind of equation system, right? You have an adjoining set of equations where you talk about how the genes are picking an environment. I'm very smart, so I I'm saying I, I have genes that I think make you very smart. So I hang out with smart people, and that's part of my environment is my fear group. So can you ask, it seems like that would be something you can do within this framework. Yes, yes. If you have a measured mediator, uh, yeah, you could, you could, you could just add that as another variable in your system, and then just test uh, what are the path coefficients. Or if you have a completely hypothesis, a completely clean mediation, and there's no direct path circling around it, uh, you could do what Judea Pearl has pointed out, which is that the testable implications of a most directed acyclic graphs all just boil down to a bunch of vanishing partial correlations. So if you wanted to test complete my, uh, mediation, you would just see if, uh, well, if I condition on my supposed mediator, does the correlation for the endpoints completely go away? That's just one example of a vanishing partial correlation applied by a, a path diagram. And um, if you have any of those in your system, you could actually test those and bolster your confidence that your a priori causal model is in fact approximating reality. Yeah, yeah, John. Uh, just small comments. This is something a question. Like, I think for the economists, one one thing I I wanted that would be good to emphasize about LD score correlation is, James, if you go back to the plot where you have the bin LD score and the, the slope for schizophrenia, it's just one remarkable thing that this shows is just how polygenic the FX are across the genome, and like so basically. The a SNPs irritability or chi squared is really depends on just how many SNPs it tags in the genome, which is really consistent on the causal effects being really scattered uniformly through the genome, which is not something that I think many of us. Yeah, yes, that's 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 true. Uh, if there were only ten causal SNPs throughout the genome, this plot would be like crazy or even negative. But um, the fact that just so it was such regularity as a SNP. Uh, is correlated with more of its neighbors. It's it's chi square statistic increases. It shows that yet another proof of of yeah high polygenicity. In fact, that was actually the first application of poly so called polygenic scores. Um, uh, uh, back in two thousand seven, um, in the schizophrenia GWAS, they were just not coming up with any hits, and people were saying, "Well, GWAS is just kind of junk." But uh, um, but then Peter Vischer and Naomi Ray they showed that. Um, Actually, the fact that the polygenic score prediction just keeps increasing as you're adding more SNPs um, means that what's really going on is the trait is highly polygenic and each SNP is of small effect that we just don't have the power to detect them individually yet. If that were not the case, the prediction R squared would just tap out with just the first 100 or 1,000 SNPs or whatever you threw in there. But it doesn't asymptote, which means that basically every SNP you're adding, every batch of SNPs you're adding contains some SNPs that have some signal. Yeah, you know, constructing the genetic covariance matrix that you yeah. have yeah. the, uh, the, the, the heritabilities that are on the bag and you said are all you know, yeah. derived from LD score regression. Yep. You're very, you also said that people don't really uh, trust those estimates. So are those yep. just the vanilla uh, heritability estimates that are coming from the same LD score regression that you are suggesting are problematic or is there some correction or what, was, what would people what would people put on the bag? So, uh, the, the diagonals just contain the the heritabilities estimated by LD score regression, and so uh, yeah, those are usually will be biased downward. But uh, um, but yes, um, we um, if 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 you're just calculating the genetic correlations, eventually, um, like your path diagram is all sort of standardized. Uh, then the cancel the magical cancellations will occur and it'll be you know okay. Oh, there's one more silly. Uh, and I think you have you oh, had your, your hand for you wanna go first? Go first. Uh, okay. I just curious. Um you mentioned the the well, why are we doing genetic correlations versus phenotypic correlations, yeah. right? And you mentioned oh it's part of it is precision. But um 
I was wondering, is there any reason why these things are going to be different, right? In a, in a world where you have Dubai, you know, not everyone's going to develop schizophrenia based on their genes, right? And is there anything to be learned from the difference between the phenotypic and the genetic? Possibly. Um, so Naomi Ray did a study where they basically went through all pairs of traits in the UK Biobank. They themselves, it's a correlation between correlations, but they themselves are highly correlated. Um, you can very well pre predict the genetic correlation from the phenotypic correlation. Interestingly, the tendency is for genetic correlations to be at least somewhat larger, which suggests that often the environmental term just acts as a no like kind of noise that degrades the underlying genetic correlation. Yeah. 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 So just a comment on that. I mean, the phenotypic correlation is also attenuated by measurement error in the phenotype. Yeah. That's often a big factor, whereas the genetic correlation is effectively corrected for measurement error. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey, just a quick question. So how do these genetic correlations tend to compare to what you would get if we just gave you the PGS for each uh, trait and calculate the correlation using the two PGSs? Oh, the genetic correlation will be much higher than that, typically. Um, the genetic correlation does not reflect measurement error, whereas the uh, the PGSs will be limited by the sample size of their respective GYs. Is that what you mean by phenotypic correlation, the correlation between the PGSs? No, the phenotype is the outcome. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you were talking about measurement error in the in the phenotype, though, right? Exactly. If you had two polygenic scores, and as you know, as you shrank the GWAS sample sizes for them, the correlation between those two polygenic scores which will probably already be lower than the phenotypic correlation will tend to go down even more. Whereas if you're calculating the genetic correlation with LD score or some other method, it doesn't have to be LD score regression. All that's by far the most commonly used. Um, your estimate will have a larger standard error, but it will still be fixed on whatever the true genetic correlation is. So this just... There's measurement error also in the PGS relative to the to the total genetic component. Right. I, I guess what I'm not I'm wondering is why the LD score regression avoids that problem that you get the problem that you get from just taking a correlation between two PGSs. Um, Maybe that's too too hard to answer. <laughs> no, uh, but I, I mean, it's based on it's from the same data. You still have these same issues of measurement error. Then I would think. I mean, the, the the high level answer I would give to that is that you can often estimate the average of a bunch of things um, more accurately than you can estimate uh, each of the components. Um, and so, a polygenic score is just basically um, a sum of all the noisy components, and the noise does not cancel; it just it just accumulates. Um, whereas um, things like estimating heritability or genetic correlation from I mean, genetic correlation, you're basically estimating the average correlation between the two betas and then over all the SNPs. Um, and so that is something where, you know, you're not necessarily accumulating noise over all the components. James, I have an answer that might help for, from a, that an economist might find helpful. I think for LD score regression, the noisy variables on the left-hand side, because it's the, that's the outcome of the GWAS and then you're regressing on the LD score, whereas for the PGS, you have all of the measurement error on the right, you know, in the construction of the variable. Yes, yes that, that's, that's a good way to put it. Um, so the the uh, independent variable is the LD scores, which in principle we can estimate have no error in them. Uh, so if the GWAS is a smaller sample size, that just increases the noise in Y. But if we have unbiased estimates of the slope and so on, uh, we can just take those forward. Analogy is like factor analysis, really. You got a bunch of multiple readings and you're extracting this factor. That's what you're calling the genetic correlation, right? And the uniquenesses would then be the measurement error, right? That's good. So yep. is this really just factor analysis and repackage? Yes. Yeah, I mean Goldberg would be very happy. I mean, to be clear, this all this past analysis stuff that James was talking, I mean, there's there's a general divide between psychologists and economists, where psychologists do everything with path diagrams and economists do it with equations. The same is true in the social science genetics. I mean, the economists doing this work are not. Hey, so all right, right, man. He's on our side. So, so, 
they're writing simultaneous equations. Right. I think that's a good spot to uh, wrap up uh, the, the Q and A for this part. So thank you, uh, James, mm -hmm. and um, uh, we have next. Yeah, well, this is getting uh, set up. Just a quick follow up on genetic correlation. I absolutely love genetic correlation. It's a big part of what we do, and. Um, in my opinion, the most interesting part about this is everybody does some sort of correlational analysis. But all of all type of correlation analysis starts with some kind of cohort where you measure two different things, right? Like you want to correlate the way with A with B, you need to be able to measure A and B in the same cohort. Genetic correlation does not require that. Because it uses genetics uh, data as a medium to allow you to correlate the genetic basis of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. But bipolar and schizophrenia can be based on completely different cohorts. You actually do not require the same cohort with both things measured, which is a big advantage. And it's actually robust to this arbitrary type of sample overlap, uh, which is a big uh, uh, you know, uh, statistical property. And going back to the question about phenotypic correlation versus genetic correlation, one uh, fun example is if you look at the phenotypic correlation between uh, coffee intake and tea intake, they're actually negatively correlated. You can measure that in UK Biobank. If you underline uh, to the GWAS and coffee intake and uh, tea intake, the genetic correlation is very significant and positive because it's caffeine intake is the same thing. So it's actually, in some cases, you do get differences. For example, I'm not sure if bipolar and schizophrenia can be diagnosed in the same person. Yes, the diagnostic criteria exclude, yeah. Right, so, so phenotypic correlation should be negative, right? Yeah. But then genetic correlation, underlying genetic basis is actually very positive for a lot of sharing. Yeah. But anyway, so uh, my name is Chong Shi Liu and uh, most people call me Q because uh, Apparently, I make gadgets for human geneticists. Um, and uh, uh, I'm from the University of Wisconsin Madison, and uh, uh, my talk is going to focus on statistical methods for polygamy risk prediction. My plan is that I have uh, several uh, very simple background slides, which overlap largely with what James has talked about. Um, but just to make sure we're on the same page, I'm, I'm going to introduce a, a number of uh, uh, modern statistical approaches for polygamy risk prediction, and, and eventually we'll end on a note about some challenges in uh, PRS or PGS. Uh, method and application. So we're talking about uh, genetic variations, uh, the positions in the genome where your DNA could differ from mine, and James already talked about, we're typically using what we call SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism, which is the simplest type of genetic variation, where uh, your DNA and mine probably only differ one particular base in this sequence. Some people have version A, some people have version B. We arbitrarily call them A1, A2, but then because we're a deployed uh, uh, organism, so you get two copies of the genome, so your genotype, suppose there are two different alleles in the population, your genotype could be A1, 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 A2, or A2, A2, right? In this case, you arbitrarily decide which allele you want to count, let's say A1, then you code these genotype data for a SNP into 0, 1, or 2. It's really just how many A1 alleles you have uh, at this particular scene, right? So, but you have this type of data for millions of variants in the genome. Then GWAS is really just to look at, uh, you know, for example, you want to do a study for Alzheimer's and cases and controls, then do you have differences in the frequency of A1s at this particular SNP? You can test that. And you do this repeatedly for millions of SNPs. So basically, you, what you end up having is this kind of Manhattan plot, right? For each data point, it's really a SNP. The y-axis is its p-value. It's a marginal association p-value that quantifies whether or not this SNP is associated with Alzheimer's case control status. You do this repeatedly, that's why you end up having millions of data points in the plot. This is axis is where they are in the genome, y axis is, oh, are they associated with Alzheimer's? You can see certain genomic regions will give you peaks, which are uh, you know, regions that seem to contribute to risk of Alzheimer's. And we're doing marginal analysis, so one SNP at a time. Uh, nothing fancy about it. Actually, statisticians will laugh at this idea. Why don't you even do multiple regression? There can be a conversation about why people do this in a specific way, but uh, this is what people do anyway. An uh, important note, though, is to talk about statistical methods about polygamy risk prediction, you need to understand what the data looks like. And this is, again, something uh, James uh, has already uh, discussed. These days, I may have a cohort of 5,000 people for Alzheimer's, but it's going to be massively underpowered. Uh, but I have friends everywhere, and they all can also contribute their sample. So it's critical for us to pull together the data and do a much bigger study so that we can see those significant findings with uh, uh, precisely measured uh, effect sizes. But there is a lot of constraint in my ability to share data. Some people don't want to share data. Some people are not allowed to share DNA data. Some companies can't share data. Some uh, countries have laws that prohibit people from sharing data from international collaborators. So what happens these days is to do meta-analysis. We can share individual-level genotype uh, phenotype matrices, but we can't share what we call summary stats. 
uh, after doing a GWAS at my side, what I end up having is this. Each row is a SNP, this is SNP ID, chromosome one, where it is on chromosome one, and then just simple linear regression coefficients, right? Regression coefficients, standard error, confidence interval, test statistic, and p-value. Nothing fancy about that, just simple linear regression. But then I share this type of data to my collaborators. They all share data, and someone in a consortium do a meta-analysis, which is just a fancy version uh, for uh, average, right? Every single side contributes their estimate and standard error for this particular SNPs association on Alzheimer's, someone in the consortium do an average, and then uh, you can have statistical theory to show that this is similar to uh, pulling together all the samples to actually do a bigger regression. And in the end, you get much better power and significant finding, right? But the key message here, though, is if you want to do any kind of predictive modeling, there are so many algorithms out there, but people take it for granted that you have the individual level data. You must begin with some kind of N by P matrices. Uh, uh, N individuals P predictors. This is precisely what we do not have in genetic prediction exercise. This is the only thing you have. Even if you are first author of this paper, you only have access to this because people only share some stats with you. So can you still make prediction when you uh, have uh, highly summarized the information without that individual level data rectangular data matrices is sort of the key behind uh, you know, the statistical method uh, for polycarious prediction. So I think it's kind of yeah, important and this is actually, although it sounds simple, it's actually a, a very crucial statistical foundation for the success of recent GWAS findings. Uh, James mentioned in his paper, nothing was found, right, based on sample size of 7,000 uh, for schizophrenia. This is the GWAS for schizophrenia. When you put together 50,000 samples, people found five new low side, 60,000, 13 new low side, uh, uh, 150,000, more than 100 low side. Last year, largest schizophrenia GWAS, about 300,000 samples in total. Now you have first world problems, right? Signals are everywhere. What does it tell you about schizophrenia again, right? But this is a different conversation. Interpretation is a different conversation. But at least you now have well-powered GWAS that gives you these findings, right? But then, um, so, so th then the question is, how do you actually make prediction based on this type of data? Um, every single paper out there look like this. It's going to be some kind of uh, additive uh, it's, it's some kind of weighted average of allele counts across many different SNPs. This is, again, 0, 1, or 2 at a particular SNP, but you need to add up the contribution possibly across millions of SNPs. Uh, the, the statistical challenge here really is just how do you weight them properly? It's, it's really the only question. Um, and then turns out this is not a trivial task uh, because uh, in GWAS we're talking about very weak effects, infinitesimal weak effects coming from many, many different sites you can't just arbitrarily decide to draw up the effects that appear weak because accumulatively, they actually uh, you know, uh, explain a large fraction of the phenotypic variance. You want to keep them, but they are very weak, so come with uh, error. So, so how do you account for that fact? It still makes the prediction work. So we are talking about uh, designing uh, approaches to, uh, to estimate this tiny and also correlated effect because, because of LG and also high dimensional effects. So some statistical ideas uh, seem to contribute to this problem. Uh, generally, uh, I would group them into statistical regularization, incorporating of functional, uh, 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 functional annotation data, and joint modeling of multiple phenotypes. But before all that even emerged in the field, the simplest type of polygamy score was based on this very naive idea. You can simply use the marginal effect size uh, you get from GWAS army statistics as a weight, right? But then, uh, typically, uh, especially in the old school approaches, people would decide to use the arbitrary p-value cutoff to truncate your data, right? If this is not significantly associated with schizophrenia, why do want to keep it in my prediction model? So a lot of older papers use 5 times 10 negative 8 as a cutoff here. But then very quickly, people realize that. I'll show you an example, but that's essentially that paper of uh, schizophrenia GWAS. People realize that if you relax this cutoff, uh, sorry, I can't find my mouse for some reason. But anyway, if you relax, this cutoff actually leads to better uh, improve, uh, improve the prediction accuracy. The reason is simple because of uh, polygenicity of a lot of different traits. Even if some SNPs did, did not reach your very stringent p-value cutoff, they actually meaningfully contribute to the phenotype with another effect. If you add them up, add this contribution up, actually improve prediction accuracy in general. So it becomes an improvement problem about how do you decide uh, the cutoff, right? What kind of SNPs do you include in the model? But it's not so different from deciding weight. This is kind of a binary problem, right? Do I shrink certain weights back to zero, uh, or do I, uh, you know, just uh, keep everything in the model? And also, because SNPs are correlated, it is a common practice to sort of prune the data. 
Uh, in this region, I have 100 different SNPs that are perfectly correlated. If you keep them all in the model, you're counting the same effect 100 times, right? So, uh, you know, people choose to just keep one that with, uh, comes with the most significant p-value, remove all its friends, right? This is called clumping or pruning, depending on uh, the specific details in the approach. But this is the simplest type of market risk score. The message is just use marginal g estimates and maybe prune the data to get rid of LD partners and maybe use a p-value cutoff to decide how many SNPs you want to keep in the model. But then, very quickly, people realize this is just not good enough. You can do a much better job than that. And this is also a field that I often encourage stats students without any biological background to get into, because they are familiar with a lot of approaches. This is just a repackaging uh, into genetic prediction uh, exercise. Um, so basically, every single paper in this field uh, is one of two categories. One is penalized regression your frequencies. Another is Bayesian approach, right? Uh, so basically, people can do something like this. It's penalized regression, uh, simplest version is lasso. You know, instead of estimating effect sizes from a least square estimator, you add some penalties, total budget, right? Okay. Uh, this uh, helps you to shrink the weaker effects to zero. Uh, you introduce a little bit bias in the effect size estimates, but improves the you know, stability of your model and overall actually contribute to better prediction accuracy. The key, though, is these methods, when they were developed, they were thinking, okay, you have X and Y, but so the methodological advance that had to be made was about, can you do this when you only have that summary statistics I was describing? Turns out you can't, people figure out how to do it. So basically in the iterative algorithm to actually estimate this type of beta in penalized regression, certain key metrics can be approximated even if you only have summary stats. You actually do not have to have X and Y. If you have some kind of X transpose Y, which is summary stats, you can still do this. Uh, but then, uh, if you find a paper that's about uh, penalized regression, it takes you 10 minutes to figure out what they're doing, because the only difference will be, you know, different papers design the penalty terms are a little bit different. There's a different type of approach, which is Bayesian approach. Try to do the same thing, statistical regularization, for some weaker effects to zero, but this is typically achieved through uh, uh, Bayesian priors. I need to design a prior of my effect size distribution, and I update that prior, combine that prior with my actual summary stats data, and then update the effect size. Eventually, the way to use will be, uh, you know, posterior effect size, posterior mean of beta, given the marginal estimates of beta, which come from summary stats and the LD matrices. You don't have to prune anything. You combine LD with marginal summary statistics, and then re-estimate each SNP's contribution through this Bayesian approach. One of the most successful papers called LD Pratt is prior is a spike and a slab, right? You have a point mass and zero with certain probability. If it's functional, if it's causal, uh, so it has a non-zero effect, then the effect size actually follows a normal distribution, right, with a certain probability. And there are some extensions in the field, for example here, another paper, extending it to a, a mixture of point mass at zero, but a normal mixture. Instead of using just one normal distribution to quantify the effect size for all causal steps, uh, you allow it to have some flexibility. It's a mixture of multiple normal distribution, more parameter estimate. Here is a different uh, parameterization uh, method called PICS. Actually, it's one of the best methods out there to help improve performance. Uh, I'm going to skip the formula part, but basically, you design a prior that sort of looks like this. You still have a big mass at zero, so you shrink the effect towards zero, but it has a heavier tail based on their formulation, so then it's more likely for you to keep the large predictors that are actually affected. But again, if you find a paper that uses Bayesian approach, it takes you 10 minutes to read it, because all you need to do is to figure out what's a prior. <laughs> and then uh, everything else is pretty much the same. MC, MC, resampling, uh, and, and you know, uh, resample the posterior distribution and use a mean as a way to calculate the actual project risk. OK, there are some idea, other ideas. So uh, uh, one type of idea that also worked quite well is to incorporating in incorporation of function annotation, the idea is if I want to predict schizophrenia, and I know as a fact this is a SNP that is in an important region for central nervous system, probably want to upweight that. Right? Remember, polygenic score, polygenic score is all about weighting. You have a SNP that has nothing to do with central nervous system, with brain, based on other annotations. You probably want to downgrade that somehow. But quantitatively, how do you do that? Again, this is actually an exercise we did. But uh, basically, you need to incorporate that information when you design a prior in the Bayesian framework. So it beca essentially becomes an empirical Bayesian framework. Can use the data to, uh, to improve your prior to some extent. And, uh, and uh, basically, you can 
estimate roughly the per SNP uh, contribution to the phenotype based on tools such as LD score regression. If I know without the actual prediction modeling exercise, I know that rheumatoid arthritis, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, their heritability are all enriched in immune related genome that will up, upweight the SNPs that come from immune related genome. But specifically, Crohn's and celiac uh, heritability is also enriched in uh, genomic regions that are important for gastrointestinal tract, uh, up with them as well, but the GI is uh, uh, independent from rheumatoid arthritis. It's immune disease, has nothing to do with GI. I don't have to up with those. So basically, you can design a prior quantitatively based on this type of enrichment, and then it turns out the posterior performance is much better. And there's a frequentist uh, version of that. Basically, when you design the penalty, different annotations can contribute different degrees of uh, penalization, and every parameter can be estimated. So, you know, you can tell it's a pretty simple type of field. Uh, a lot of ideas are shared, although, you know, it takes a lot of time to implement this type of idea. And then uh, another type of idea that works is to incorporate uh, multiple phenotypes. You can think of this as a uh, type of function annotation, right? Uh, if I want to predict schizophrenia, it turns out this SNP, I know, is correlated with depression, uh, bipolar, uh, anorexia. Uh, all those phenotypes that have some degree of sharing with schizophrenia, then I want to up with this SNP in my exercise for schizophrenia prediction. Another way to look at this is uh, essentially to increase effective sample size. If I have a GWAS for schizophrenia, my friend has another GWAS for schizophrenia, obviously you want to combine these samples to improve the GWAS and then improve uh, risk prediction power. But my friend's GWAS is not for schizophrenia, it's for bipolar. So then I still want to combine them because we know there's genetic sharing between phenotypes, but I need to apply a discount because it's not schizophrenia. To what extent I can borrow information from that external GWAS to improve my prediction of schizophrenia is a statistical problem, right? You need to quantify that, uh, which is essentially quantified by genetic correlation, right? The degree of genetic similarity across phenotypes. Then uh, in terms of statistical model techniques, if you use Bayesian framework, basically you can design the prior a little bit differently. This is a bivariate version of that spike and slab. There are SNPs that are uh, functional in both diseases. There are SNPs that are bi bipolar specific, schizophrenia specific, or just absolutely zero in both diseases. Not a lot of parameters to estimate, right? But eventually it's the same kind of basement frame. Leverage this type of pervasive genetic correlation across a lot of different phenotypes. Yeah. Anyways, take it, take, take it one step back, okay? A big part of what I'm saying is, uh, the big challenge in risk prediction is you don't have the individual level data, which is why everything I talked about have that linearity form. You know, it's just about using penalized regression, Bayesian framework, and, and it's really just about the fact that people have figured out how to do those type of techniques in summary statistics, but then there are tons of methods out there in just machine learning in general about predicting certain things, but just because you don't have that individual level data set, a lot of things people take for granted cannot be directly applied into risk prediction. I'll give you one example. Here, the problem is about uh, tuning parameter. So even in the simplest type of risk prediction, you have a tuning parameter, which is a p-value cutoff. Like I said, older papers use p-value cutoff 5, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 8. Some papers use a p-value cutoff 1, basically throw everything to your model. This is a decision that is uh, you know, somewhat arbitrary. If you have a second data set, that can help you try different choices here and see which one give you the improved performance, then uh, uh, this is called model tuning. You know? But after that, you need to apply the score in independent data. Right? That tuning data set can be part of your testing sample, which creates a problem because the whole point of this is individual level testing data is very precious. I, I, I have my 300 sample that I want to invest a hypothesis on. I don't want to reserve 100 sample just for model tuning. right? So how do you select the optimal tuning parameter? By the way, this type of decision actually matters a lot, goes by the word James said. Um, if you want to predict schizophrenia, one of the early surprises is that if you use a p-value cut of 0.5, not 0.05, which is very liberal, uh, actually give you the most predictive score, which is early indication that maybe schizophrenia genetics is very polygenic. You want to throw more SNPs into a model. So this type of decision actually matters a lot. If you use five times two negative eight and the p-value cut off, you'll get a terrible polygenic score. So, this is a weird problem. If you ask a bunch of statisticians, so how do we do model tuning? In the context of genetic risk prediction, half the room would say, what's fun in that? You know, we know how to do that. Half the room would tell you this is impossible. 
right? <laughs> it's really strange. The reason is simple. We know how to do it. It's true. It's called cross validation. The idea is if you have uh, in individual level data, uh, you know, uh, the number of n by p uh, individuals and predictors, and then some phenotype, you can do sample splitting, right? Basically, what it does is you can train your data, train your model on 80% of your sample, and then tune your model on 20% of your sample. And then you rotate the choice if you want to do cross validation. But sample splitting works similarly. But basically, try your different models in the 80% of your sample, evaluate their performance on the reserved holdout sample. After that, choose the best performing model, then fix it, move on to do out of sample prediction, right? But then the problem is if you only have two assumptive statistics, you don't have sample to split, right? You don't have a matrix that allow you to split uh, a holdout sample. So then to me, uh, uh, this is what we do in the lab. Uh, mm -hmm. A big part of what we do is can we pour some of the most basic type of machine learning ideas into GWASAMI statistics. Basically, can you actually do a cross validation on GWASAMI data when your data, data actually look like this? Turns out, uh, very talented undergrads at the time in my lab figured it out. Uh, it's actually not very sophisticated in some mathematics. We had a paper to talk about that. Uh, but the idea is actually that so suppose you have GWAS sum statistics, this is your real data, many, many different SNPs and marginal effect sizes, you know, p values quantified in association with the phenotype. Can I mimic that process? Yes, I can't split samples. But after you split sample, what you would do is actually run the GWAS on this data, right? And then based on that GWAS results to train different polygenic score models. So can I bypass that, start with the summary stats based on 100% of your sample, then create a pseudo summary stats as if it's coming from 80% of your sample. Right. So this is essentially a very simple statistical problem. I just need to add a little bit of noise to it. This is from 100%. Condition on this, how do I mimic the process of downsampling and having a noisier version of GWAS summary stats, and we know how much noise you need to add into it. Once you have that, this is, can be directly calculated because they need to sum up back to the total sample, right? But then once you have the training summary stats coming from 80% of a sample, you can train all the models, right? Because all the models out there only require summary stats. Can you evaluate their performance on the second summary statistics? Turns out that is a problem that's solvable as well. So basically, you can use summary statistics to cross validate, to model tuning and benchmark without that. So this is just one example, but it is actually possible, but not always trivial, to incorporate some of the basic machine learning ideas out there when you only have some of that data. Uh, so this is uh, you know, actively uh, evolving field. If you actually apply it to, for uh, say, attention attainment, you will see that you really want to keep uh, the p-value threshold very liberal. This is the long-term home p-value. So this is a p-value cut of one. Having more steps in the model give you superior prediction performance based on summary stats. Cross validation, out of sample prediction is very consistent with that. If you want to predict Alzheimer's, no. After a certain point, if you keep adding SNPs into the model, you have a very massive decline in prediction performance. Again, very consistent with external validation data. So it depends on the genetic architecture, depending on what phenotype you want to study. Then uh, we actually move this a little bit further. So then uh, another uh, uh, fun and effective approach in machine learning is called ensemble learning, right? Based on my data, I can train model A, model B, model C, model D. I don't know which one's better, but if I can train another level of uh, regression to combine these models together, the simplest form is just to run a regression on four different models to combine them using some weights, then that can potentially improve my model. Uh, eventually, but then this is also not possible. If you have individual level data, this is trivial. You just reserve some sample to train separate models, to tune separate models, and reserve a second data set to train that additional regression, eventually use everything else to evaluate the performance. Because basically you have the summary stats based version for sample splitting, you can create 80% of summary stats 10%, 10%, something like that, to use summary stats to achieve you know, model fine tuning, uh, ensemble learning, and eventually benchmarking. Everything only depends on the initial summary statistics you have. So it's actually a pretty flexible framework. Uh, I'm personally very proud of this type of work uh, because I would argue that if someone develops a new polygenic score model that is superior than everybody else, you shouldn't use it alone. You should still combine that model with everything else in the literature through ensemble learning. So mathematically, you should. Uh, theoretically achieve even better prediction accuracy. So it's a pretty general framework that should be universally applicable. I'll skip this slide, just performance. Moving up, this is probably more important. So far, what I've talked about is 
If you give me a GWAS, how do I make prediction? It's a very statistical problem, right? But if your GWAS is flawed, I can't help you with that, right? Whatever prediction I, 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 I do is going to be on that flawed phenotype. And then this, in my opinion, is one of the most interesting things in the past five, six years, and what I've heard uh, this yesterday, is genetic nurture, right? Um, people, <laughs> we talk about uh, why there's no environment in, in GWAS models. You'd be surprised how many people, how many human geneticists truly believe that environment doesn't exist. This is not even a joke. It's just in our models, environment is nowhere to be found. And part of the argument is because nothing changes your DNA. Code, okay? Nothing changes your DNA. What you eat, what you drink, uh, whether you're rich or poor, is not going to change your DNA once you're conceived, right? So that we feel so comfortable the field feels so comfortable that genetic association of phenotypes, although causality is difficult to demonstrate, but it's less confounding. Ancestry is a big confounder. There's a 15 year literature on how to correct for that, but we think we have done that. But for many years, people thought there would be no other type of confounder that would completely ruin your GWAS signal. And that is something you absolutely do not want in your GWAS, right? You don't want confounded results. But then in retrospect, this is obvious, but one type of Neglected confounder is actually parental genome, right? Where do you get your genes? Your parents give you, and they have the same genes, and their genes can influence your educational attainment through pathways that are not mediated by the actual genotypes you inherited, right? So this is completely confounded, and if you uh, do polygen risk score based on confounded GWAS, you get confounded scores, right? So then, uh, how do you account for this type of problem? Some people would, uh, would do things like, once I have the flawed score, can I improve my downstream design to eliminate some of these artifacts. My argument would always be that just do a better GWAS. If you have power, obviously in principle this is possible, but, but the empirical power would be a concern. But if you have unlimited resource, you need to do a better job uh, at the GWAS stage. After you have improved the GWAS without confounding, the rest is straightforward. Just apply whatever polygenary scores uh, methods are there. Uh, we actually had a paper uh, a couple of years ago about how to use multi-generational GWAS data to uh, get rid of the uh, uh, genetic nurture confounding. The idea is essentially to do GWAS in trios. When you have parental genotype data as covariates in the multiple regression, but obviously you don't have enough trios, right? If you have enough trios, this is a trivial problem. But then without trios, how do you mimic that process? Turns out you can go to UK Bio Bank, 500,000 people, and ask about their children. Now, if you have their children's phenotype data and parents' genotype data, uh, and, and then you also have a standard GWAS where you regress everybody's own phenotype on their own genotype, you can reconstruct these direct and indirect effect weights from these separate GWAS. So it's actually a pretty uh, straightforward mathematical problem. But it's kind of cool that we can do that. After that, though, you basically have GWAS on direct effect on EA and indirect nurture effect on EA. Once you have the GWAS, you can do the genetic correlation stuff with a lot of other things, which is actually quite interesting because I think James showed some negative correlation between maybe you did it for cognitive performance, so maybe it's slightly different. But anyway, the point is it's known that a lot of psychiatric disorders is uh, genetically and negatively correlated with educational attainment. But once you split the EA component into direct and indirect effect, you see that a lot of that correlation only comes from indirect effect. So it used to be the case that, okay, is it possible that having higher education decreases my risk of depression or having depression increases my risk of dropping out of school? That used to be the interpretation of this type of genetic correlation. When you have this, it becomes a completely different story. They're saying depressive parents may have a negative impact on their children's education. You have this multi-generational component in it now, right? Because we're talking about the indirect parental effect on children's education, that being correlated with a lot of things. But because your fundamental GWAS of EA is confounded, all that is mixed together when you just test genetic relationship between education and a lot of other things. One outlier though is autism. Autism actually is purely uh, correlated with direct effect. It really, it, it's about the uh, alleles you actually inherit from your parents. Those tend to be the alleles that increase your risk. But why do you stop with parents? Why not just think neighborhoods or grandparents? Or, exactly. There are a whole set of other ex environments. So is there a general approach to it? solving the environmental. I would say mathematically, yes. The big challenge is do you have that kind of data yeah, in the profile right. you have? If you have the data, yes, absolutely, I would, would support doing that. How would you do it? I have like neighborhood correlations on top of it. So well, that have, yeah. You can regress your neighbor's phenotype on your genotype mm -hmm. and see what kind of effect you have. 
And based on your underlying model, you can reconstruct. And but if the neighborhood is being selected by some genetic manifestation, yeah. now we're back to some simultaneity, I guess. Yeah. 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 In Pearl's colorful language is colliders, but, but literally, uh, you have a simultaneous determination. Yeah. Uh, it obviously depends on the specifics, but for example, in this ex uh, exercise of uh, uh, genetic nurture, you could ask a similar type of question, what if parents are not right, randomly right. paired? We can actually allow that as a parameter. Uh, you can have a parameter for assorting mating. If you have an estimate of that, you can incorporate that into the framework. For the neighborhood uh, selection problem, I would imagine you can do something similar and have more sophisticated model to account for this type of effect. It just makes the eventual derivation a little bit more complicated and potentially will reduce the power. Right? Well, but see. if you have the data in principle, I don't see the reason not doing that. Yeah. Right. So is that been done though? No, no. It's just because A, in human genetics, people pretend these are not problems. And B, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in some cases, so that, yeah. in some cases, in the in these big biopatent cohorts, when they designed the survey, they didn't have this type of problem in mind. So you may not have the variables you actually need. It's possible that you have a smaller cohort with the perfect type of data you want, but it's going to be an underpowered GWAS. So uh, that's an empirical challenge. Oh, sorry, I'll drop out, sorry. Uh, very quickly, sorry, I didn't pay attention. Uh -huh. But yeah, uh, I'll end on uh, two very quick notes. A, sometimes, what I talked about before is, okay, sometimes your polygenary score is not predicting what you think it is predicting. There's another side of this. Should we make a prediction at all? In human genetics, you get a lot of pushbacks on this sort of thing. For example, big GWAS on uh, non-heterosexual uh, uh, behavior, and, uh, <laughs> Very quickly after this science paper came out, some American entrepreneur in Uganda developed an uh, app called How Gay Are You? Claiming based on this GWAS, you can use genetic information to predict how gay are you. And the catch is, it's, LGBT is illegal in Uganda. So what are you doing with this, right? It becomes hugely controversial. I'm not pretending I know the answer, but obviously you can see the controversy. And then some people are interested in doing uh, polygenic embryonic selection. CRISPR gets a lot of buzz, right? Uh, but it's actually uh, unrealistic to, genetic, to do genetic editing for complex traits, which like schizophrenia is affected by so many different loci. But then it's actually technologically possible to uh, look at the, the 10, 15 embryos in IVF created by the same couple, and then choose the taller baby, smarter baby, by looking at their polygenic scores. It's not illegal in the US. It's actually you know, being done in some companies. Um, so that should we do it, should we not do it, becomes controversy. You know, reducing disease risk is, is one story, but enhancer, in, enhancing certain traits is another. Uh, I just want to throw the story out there. And finally, I, this is going to be one slide. Uh, most of our training data in all these prediction models are not explaining why. Empirically, it's just so obvious that if you port these scores to other ancestries, for example, in uh, people of African descent in UK Biobank, you get maybe 25%, 20% of the predictive performance. So then we obviously want to eventually use these scores, for example, in clinical setting to predict cancer risk, uh, cardiovascular disease risk. The provocative argument is actually that if you use these scores today in a clinical setting, you exacerbate uh, health disparity because you have a magic score that works a lot better in one population, but not everybody else. So then uh, a lot of what we do is actually to design statistical methods to, uh, to, to sort of uh, uh, makes the polygenic score more portable and effectively useful across ancestral population. I'll skip the details. And I'll stop here. Some of the actual work was done by maybe Chinese and also collaboration with Jason and Lauren, uh, but I'm happy to discuss. Thank you very much. <laughs> I love it. This is great. Thank you so much. Uh, very informative. First, I wanted to uh, echo the geneticists don't think um, environment is an issue. I was talking to one of the co authors in the Song and All paper, and I'm just for curiosity asking, did you think? Uh, what was the, your prior before seeing the results? And they're like, oh, we've never expected the environment to, to play such a big role. And as an economist, I thought that was absurd. <laughs> of course, yeah, I don't... for rental background, you don't need a variable, right? So that's one thing. The other thing is um, you mentioned the two GWAS, your you know, family, I think it's a family GWAS, but you still, you know, if I'm interested, like as a consumer of this, if I'm interested in the direct or the causal effects of genes on education, um, it's not enough to have the GWAS, right? I still need to use a family design in the day, right? Even if you like did the GWAS, you know, you got rid of the biases on the GWAS, you still need to, you know, the data where you're doing an analysis is, is, is there's still this correlation between, you know, there's still genetic nurturing in the data where you are applying this polygenic scores. Absolutely, I guess two different comments. First is, um, 
this is in addition to what people have been doing, right? A lot of people have been trying to use family data in the downstream. Right. But but uh, yeah, right. like this, you know. Right. But your score when your score is based on a flawed GWAS, you get a baggage in the weights. And then we had actually had a paper talking about, for example, in sibling uh, design, if your score is traditional polygenic risk score, you think you are getting causal effect of the polygenic risk score, you really aren't. But so okay. so that, that's sort of the technical bias. Yeah. But if you improve the GWAS and the downstream uh, sample, you can do a much better job. I agree yeah. that the, the, the weights are going to be better, but you know, you're still applying the same weights for the whole sample. So you still have some, say, exogenous variation in economics jargons, right? So you still have a direct effect of the, of the G. You're just using the weights are not optimal, but you're, you're applying this weight for all the population. So like the fact that, you know, my siblings didn't inherit gene X, it's, right. true, true. it's like a weighted, so weighted average of different logics, right, you can see. And the weights are not, that's how- I, I guess it depends on eventually what is the parameter you're trying to estimate. I think a very specific point I'm trying to make is some people tend to interpret, for example, sibling design PGS analysis as the causal effect from this component. What I'm saying is it's untrue. You still get biases coming from these. Although in the downstream analysis, you simply sample to con <laughs> control the family environment and other sorts of compounding, you're not completely getting rid of biases coming from indirect genetic component simply because the weights that get into a polygenic score is flawed. That is the point I'm making. Yeah, I want to talk more about Of course. That. I don't want to take the question. Here, you have it. Yeah, well, it's very naive question, and, and maybe I'm both of you, but uh, everything you say makes perfect sense, conditional on a, on a particular specification of the model, which is this linear score. Yes. I've done a lot of scoring in a completely different context on the insurance data, trying to predict accidents. One thing that came out very strongly is that there are some interactions that you cannot disregard, like the power of the car has a completely different impact for a young driver than for an old driver and so on. So my question is, uh, how robust is all this? Uh, assume that your model is in fact misspecified in the sense that the true model has some interactions that you're ignoring. Uh -huh. These are not things that you're going to correct by increasing the size of the, of the sample or whatever. Yeah. So my question is, is, is there did you guys do some kind of robustness testing by, for instance, introducing in your linear regression a small number of interactions? Of course, you're not going to, to, to introduce all the interaction, but let's say interaction between the most significant yes. steps and, that, uh, and how robust is it to that? Yes, uh, so two, two answers. A, suppose there is strong interaction uh, between different SNPs in the genome. This type of models, not this, but the polygenic risk score models, are not going to be robust. Obviously, you will have issues in the scores you create. You have to account for the interaction coefficients. The question, though, is in complex trait genetics, not rare disease, but complex trait genetics, amazingly, we have not seen evidence for deviation from complete additivity. And this is a consistent observation across many different traits. I'm sure for the car example, no, no, it is true. Before, yeah. But for complex trait genetic application, this is actually fairly consistent observation. I, in fact, at one point, one of the prominent uh, cardiovascular uh, disease geneticists, Seth Katherson, uh, challenged the community on Twitter. You know, academic Twitter is a thing in our field. So that said, so can anyone tell me any robust gene gene interaction for complex disease? And people gave some, you know, anecdotal examples, but really those are from rare variations. Uh, it's not very uh, uh, consistent uh, observed in complex diseases that are uh, affected by common. But don't you have the problem of I, I guess I don't quite get it because the data you're talking about, which is this summary data, but you're, without the, the sample sizes of combining data, how, how did they come to that conclusion of no interaction? That's what it's like. Well, but people have tried uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, test the gene interaction in each side and then meta analyze that and see if you have any evidence of, uh, of finding signal. But I, I think maybe some people would disagree with that because they try really hard to raise their hand. But my, my point is the evidence is weak for them. Yeah. No, I, I don't disagree. I wanna I wanna amplify what you're saying. I so so there's a so first of all, there are, there are methods that are not looking at individual SNP effects, but partitioning the variants to into the additive variants and then the the non-additive yeah. variants like the the dominance and the the epistasis, the gene gene interactions, and those studies 
consistently find that for these complex traits that those non-additive components explain a very small amount of the variance. There's also, it's not, it's not just an empirical observation. There's good theoretical arguments for why the additive component should explain um, you know, much of the variance. Um, so there's some based on natural selection that I'm sure James could talk about if you're interested. There's also, or, uh, or you know, at least inheritance, the way that genes are inherited from one generation to the next. I mean, in brief, it's basically that the nonlinearities get broken up as, you, as a result of the inheritance. Um, so it's hard for those effects to persist. Um, the, there's also statistical arguments like, you know, if you have a, um, an allele that has the minor allele frequency, say, is 10%, then the frequency of the um, having two of those minor alleles is only 1% in the population. So you're going to fit almost all the data by ignoring that um, one out of the three genotypes and just fitting a line to the other two. So even if there's non-additive effects in terms of the, the true effects, in terms of variance explained, you're going to fit it all with just um, a line going through those two points. Any other uh, questions, comments? Yeah, Dan. Earlier in the exchange during your talk, I thought I heard something that was confusing to me, but maybe you can clarify. So uh, the conversation was like, why stop at parents when we're worried about sort of confounding other effects? Um, and I would have thought that the answer is conditional on your parents' genotype. Your genotype is random. And so like there may be other things that influence your life outcome. I'm sure there are. But for identifying purely the effect of your genes, uh, no, no, but, but for example, I thought mean, so we were talking about, for example, neighbors, right? Conditioning our uh, parents. Yeah, uh, conditioning your parents' genome. You know, so my well, non biological in that the non biological sufficient the divorce. We're also taking down the from the neighbors. No, no, yeah, because we see that to be environmental. It should be balanced, conditional on. I guess it depends on what you want to do. I wouldn't call that confounding, but you can imagine an actual causal pathway where the genome mediation is other stuff like Yes, but for confounding, like what's the effect? Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Yes. Yeah. That's a very there is something special about parents in particular in the yeah. genetics context. Yeah. It's, it's sort of like if you look at the genetics of obesity, you know, a lot of people were thinking of you know, fat accumulation, metabolism, that sort of thing. When you actually look at the GWAS, they got a large component about anorexia, you know, psychiatric component that explains a lower BMI. They got a large component about physical activity. Are you a gym rat? You know, that is explained by genetics. And, and uh, you know, a large component about food addiction, you know, substance dependence. So that, but you can argue that all that complex behavioral pathways are on the causal pathway. So you may not want to take care of that, right? These are not confounders, but if you had a specific mechanism in mind, the score may not uh, uh, predict because what you think it is doing. So uh, there's some nuance in this. Yeah. 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 Yeah